Now, in all the victimless crimes there are out there, how many people really believe that society is benefiting because you paid that traffic ticket? I mean, we're so much better off now because we don't have drunk driving, right? We're not going to mention the fact that the state has gotten billions of dollars in taking your car away fees. Why is that the case? And how come all the fees that it collects for taking your car, impounding your vehicle, doesn't go to the victims of drunk drivers who are killed by other drunk drivers? No, it goes into the state's coffers. So they're the benefits, not... They're the beneficiaries of all the money that's being collected, not the individuals who are injured, who they are supposedly representing. So we're going to discuss attorneys. The issue can be made even clearer by a second very appropriate example. The legal profession's labor union, the Bar Association, was established immediately after the Civil War. They got rid of the original 13th Amendment, barring titles of nobility such as Esquire and Honorable, to substitute a system of general slavery to replace the old system of black slavery by guaranteeing a monopoly of the courts for attorneys, judges, and municipal corporations. And if you'll notice, anytime you go to court, it is exactly that. It's a, it's a conflict of interest like there's no tomorrow because the judge's salary comes directly from the corporate coffers. So when you get convicted, that goes to paying his wages. That's a conflict of interest. This labor union, the Bar Association, has forbidden anyone but union bar attorneys from giving legal advice and has prevented anyone from being assisted in court by a non-union lawyer or by a non-lawyer, thus converting the courts into closed union shops. Now, I don't know if you know it, but the California Constitution says you have a right to counsel, and it doesn't state that the counsel has to be a bar card carrying attorney. It doesn't state that. The Constitution of 1850 was created before the corporation took over, and you have the right to counsel the same is true of the Constitution of the United States, where it says you have the right to counsel. This corresponds to pre-Civil War United States, wherein blacks were not taught to read and were not allowed to get a public education, lest they become strong enough persons to speak out against their repression and overthrow their slave masters. Jury duties and nullification. The jury has the right to determine both the law and the facts. 1804, Samuel Chase, who was a Supreme Court Justice from 1741 to 1811, said those words. Think about it. The right to determine both the law and the facts. Well, that's pretty much everything. Quote, it is only his right... It is not only his right, but his duty to find the verdict according to his own best understanding, judgment, and conscience, though in direct opposition to the direction of the court. St. John Adams in 1771. Now, how many jurors today do you think would rebel against the judge's orders to do what he tells them to do and to only consider what he tells them to consider? If you cited John Adams there, what do you think would happen? You'd be bumped off the jury because you're not suitable for the corporation to make money. Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, Horning versus District of Columbia, 249 U.S. 596, 1920, another U.S. Supreme Court decision, quote, the jury has the power to bring a verdict in the teeth of both law and fact. So in other words, they can disregard whatever law is being issued by the court, statute, and code, and ordinances, because they can make their own law. The jury decides the law and the facts. So under common law, there is no statutes, codes, regulation, acts, or in other words, no legislated law that applies to a sovereign. How many times a day do the, quote, people of California, the alleged plaintiff, as represented without power of attorney from anyone by the state, 
bring charges against real people of California, the individual, when no one has been injured, about 99% of the time. So let's look at the laws in California. Quote, it is the public policy of this state that the public agencies exist to aid in the conduct of the people's business. The people of the state do not yield their sovereignty to the agencies which serve them. Quote, California Government Code Section 11120. Under the California Constitution, Article 6, Judicial Section 1. This is current California Constitution law. Look it up. The judicial power of this state is vested in the Supreme Court, Courts of Appeal, and Superior Courts, all of which are courts of record says right there, all of which are courts of record. So every court in the state is a court of record. Now let's look at what Black's Law says about a court of record. A court of record is a judicial tribunal having attributes and exercising functions independently of the person of the magistrate designed generally to hold it and proceeding according to the course of common law its acts and proceedings being enrolled for a perpetual memorial. Jones versus Jones, 188, Missouri, Appellate Court 220. Ex parte, Gladhill, 8. So we see that if you're in a court of record and it's proceeding according to common law, although this is Black's Law 4th edition back when it was, you know, pre-corporation. That doesn't change the fact that the California Constitution still says it's a court of record. Every court is a court of record, and that a court of record proceeds according to common law. So if you're sovereign and you enter into a contract like a marriage license agreement with the state, and the state comes along and takes your children, do you have to abide by that? If you're sovereign, you decree the law, which means I decree these are my children and the state has no interest in them. Show me how you acquired an interest in my children that you can do these things. So we're going to read another Supreme Court decision that shows just because you don't express all of your rights as a sovereign that they're denied. Quote, it is one thing to find that the tribe has agreed to sell the right to use the land and take valuable minerals from it, and quite another to find that the tribe has abandoned its sovereign powers simply because it has not expressly reserved them through a contract. To presume that a sovereign forever waives the right to exercise one of its powers unless it expresses it expressly reserves their right to exercise that power in a commercial agreement turns the concept of sovereignty on its head. That's Marion et al. DBA, Marion and Baitless et al. versus the Jicarilla Apache tribe et al. 1982 Supreme Court 455 U.S. 130. So there when the state says that just because you got a marriage license you've lost the right to your children if you're sovereign, how could you possibly lose that right just because you didn't expressly reserve it when you signed the marriage license? See, we have to understand what are the elements of a lawful contract. If the state didn't explain that to you when you went into the agreement to get the marriage license, then it's an unconscionable contract and void. And if you claim that you're sovereign, it's also void. So now you know at least you've been shown evidence that you are sovereign, the common law applies, and that the elements of a lawful contract are hardly ever in force in what we take to believe are the contracts and agreements we engage in with the government, banks, and other institutions. In my experience, in most people's lives, the largest expense and thus the best place to start looking for contractual fraud is involved in home loans. The next biggest expense is the fraudulent taking of your money through taxation by the Internal Revenue Service. And the third largest expense is related to car loans. 
and related charges.